Okay, question number 61. It's asking us about possible outcomes. So when we think about possible outcomes, we are thinking about sample space. We're thinking about tree diagrams, lists, tables, Think about the possible outcomes. So we're told Robin tosses a fair coin, which just means a regular coin, 50-50, heads, tails, and then draws a ball from a bag containing one red, one blue, and one green. So two things are happening. The coins being thrown in the air, and then also she's picking from a bag where there's one red, one blue, and one green. What are the possible outcomes? So I'm just going to write it as a list. It could be heads and red, heads and blue, heads and green, or it could be tails and red, tails and blue, tails and green. So there's six outcomes I've got here. Now, the other thing that we should do to check is use what we know about fundamental counting principle, which is we look at the number of outcomes on the coin, which is two. The number of outcomes from one pick in the bag is three. So we've got to multiply two by three, we get six. We should have six things in our list, and we do. So we should try and write very neatly this thing on this line. So heads red heads and blue, heads and green, tails and red, tails and blue, tails and green. So six things. Now part B says this situation changes. Three more are added to the bag. So let me just change the color here. And we still have the same coin. Where's two outcomes, heads or tails. Now inside this bag, some things change. Instead of having a red, we've now got a red and a red. Instead of having a blue, we've got a blue and a blue. Instead of having a green, we've got two greens. So when we think about the number of outcomes that could happen from us reaching into this bag, we've got to still think only three different things can happen. We can either choose a red, blue, or a green. The number of different things, now the keyword is different, the number of different things that can happen is still three. So our outcomes are still going to be the same, head and a red, head and a blue, head and a green, tails and a red, tails and a blue, tails and a green. Nothing else changed. We didn't add any different colors. So for our answer, will the total number of outcomes change? The answer is no. The outcomes stay the same. because no new colors were added. Okay, so our list is still gonna be the same. We could even write out that list again. Nothing changed with the list. Okay, I'm gonna move on. Question number 62. Okay, so it's a little small on the screen, but it says, Coach Wilson ordered t-shirts for the basketball team from two different t-shirt suppliers. So I'm gonna call it t-shirt supplier A and t-shirt supplier B. Now, the first t-shirt supplier charges $16 per shirt. So I'm trying to get rid of all these words, as many words as possible, and just write out the key information. And then there's 5% shipping. Nothing about tax, just shipping. The second supplier charges $18 per shirt plus 7%. So already it's looking like the first supplier is a better deal because they're cheaper per shirt and the shipping charge is also less. So we've pretty much got everything from the start of this question already written down. Now part A says, Coach Wilson ordered the same number of shirts from each supplier. Write an expression to find the shipping charges he paid for each supplier. Now here we've got to be very careful. We don't know how many shirts he purchased. We just know it's the same number of shirts for each supplier. So we're going to call it X. So X is the number of shirts he ordered from each. So here if I write supplier A, if he ordered X number of shirts, his total cost was 16 times X. So if he bought one shirt, it would cost $16. Two shirts, 32, and so on. 
but then there's a 5% shipping charge. Now if the shipping charge was 5%, what we're going to do if we're only after the amount of shipping, we're going to multiply this by 0 0.05. And that's going to be our expression for the first supplier. We're not after the total cost, we're just after the shipping charges. Now B is pretty similar. Instead of $16 per shirt, it's $18 per shirt. And instead of 5%, it's 7%. So 7% is written as 0 0.07. Now part B, I'm just going to change up the color. For part B, it says the first supplier gave Coach Wilson a discount of 10% off his order total. The second supplier gave him a discount of $20 off. So different units. The first one is 10% off. The second one is $20 off. Write an equation. This time it wants an equation, so there has to be an equal sign to find the total cost T of the shirt. So let's look at supplier A this time. The total cost T equals, well, 16X is the total cost before any discount or shipping. Now if there's 10% off, this is a little tricky, but if there's 10% off, I'm only paying for 90%. So I'm going to multiply this by 0 0.9 because I'm paying for 90%. And then I've got the shipping charge on top of that, which is 5% shipping charge. So I'm going to multiply by 105%. I'm going to include that 5% on with the 100 because if I just multiplied this by 0 0.05, I just end up with that shipping charge. So I've got to remember that it's the whole thing plus the shipping charge. So this is my first equation. Now, I could multiply the 16 by the 0.9 by the 1.05 and then just put the x next to it. Or I could just leave it as it is. B. In B, the total cost was $18 per shirt. Now, the discount isn't 10% off here. The discount is $20 off, so I'm just going to subtract 20. And then I'm going to multiply by 107% because 7% is my tax. So that is my equation for B. Now part C of this question is if Coach Wilson ordered 15 t-shirts from each supplier, how much did he pay? So what we'd have to do is we now know that x equals 15 and we would substitute 15 into each of these. And so A and B, I'm going to skip some work, but all that we're doing is we're plugging in 15 into x. So the first equation would be 16 times 15 times by 0.9 and then times by 1.05 and that would give us an answer. And then the second one, the total would be 18 times 15 minus 20, and then we would multiply that whole thing by 1.07. So I'm going to very quickly do the math and then write the answers. Okay, so we just calculated this, and so A was, now we've got to remember it's dollars, it's $226.80, and B was $267.50. So it says, Coach Wilson ordered 15 t-shirts from each supplier. How much did he pay? Now, with some of the classes, we actually had a discussion about this. Is this good enough to leave our answer like this? And we believe that, especially because underneath C, it has one line. It has answer followed by a line. So we thought it says, how much did he pay in total? Now, we've already shown how much he paid to each supplier, but I'm pretty sure that we should add the 26750 with the 226.8 and that gives us a total when we add them both together our total is four hundred and ninety four dollars and thirty cents and so that is our total for number 62 part C three so in this question we are told that a company manufactures televisions and for every 1,000 televisions, testing shows that 20 out of the 1,000 are defective. 
So 20 defective, so that means broken, out of a total of 1,000. Now part A says what is the experimental probability? Now with televisions it's not like rolling a die. We can't say the six sides and each side is equally as likely to happen. So this information up here is from a kind of experiment. We're told that they make a thousand televisions and 20 of them are defective. So in fact this is our experimental probability. 20 over 1000 is our answer. Now we can simplify. We can take a zero off the top and off the bottom. So this becomes 2 over 100. Now 2 over 100 is 2%. 2% is a good answer. Or you could simplify your 2 over 100 to 1 over 50. So either of these two answers is good. Now it says based on the probability in part A, how many of the next 5,000 televisions manufactured should the company expect to be defective? So a few ways to do this. We know 2% are defective. So you could just do find 2% of 5,000. So you could do this by doing 0 0.02 times by 5,000. That's one method. The other way is to write a proportion. So if 2 out of every 100, or 1 over 50, it doesn't really matter, Two out of every hundred are defective. We're trying to find how many out of 5,000 are defective. So let's actually change this. Let's make it one over 50. So here we can cross multiply, we could do that, or we could just see scaling. The 50 turns into 5,000 by timesing by 100. So we've got to do the same to the top. One times 100 equals 100, so x equals 100. So if they manufactured 5,000 televisions, they would expect 100 TVs to be defective. So that was number 63. OK, moving on, 64. Linda wants to buy a cell phone. She looked at two cell phones, phone A, which usually costs $175 and it has a 5% discount and phone B which usually costs $200 and it has a 20% discount and it says how much is the discount for each phone so if we're looking at the discount for A we've got to do 175 times by 0 0.05. That's going to give us our discount. And as this is a book three type question, we would have a calculator as well. So we could just do 175 times by 0 0.05. And so this gives us $8.75. So that's our discount for A based on 5%. So for B, our discount is 20% of 200, so 200 times by 0 0.2, it's 20%. So this gives us $40. So we could leave our answer a little clearer. So the discount, discount for A is $875. Discount for B is $40. Now part B says, what is the price of each phone after the discount? So in this case, we're going to take, let's take phone A first. Now the original price was 175 and we're subtracting 875. So 175 subtract 8.75 gives us an answer of 166.25. That's our price after the discount for phone A. Phone B, original price was was actually $200, and we're going to subtract $40, the discount. So that 200 minus 40 gives us a price of $160. So these are the prices of the two phones. Okay, part C. Part C says, which discounted phone costs less? So when we look at this, this is just simply comparing 160 with 166.25. So we can see right here 
that phone B, $160, $160 is cheaper. So phone B is cheaper. Now looking at this, it also then goes on to say, Linda will have to pay 6% sales tax on whichever phone. So it doesn't matter which one she chooses, she's got to add 6%. Does this change which phone costs less? And it doesn't. Even if she buys phone A at $166.25, when she adds 6%, it's gonna increase by 6%. When she adds 6% to the 160, it's gonna increase by 6% again. Phone B is still cheaper, even after adding the 6% to both. So phone B is still cheaper. So we must say that. Does this change which phone costs less? So adding sales tax does not change which is cheaper. Here goes. Okay, so in question number 65, we are told that two people are filling envelopes for a charity. Today, William stuffed a total of 70 envelopes. So you know what? I'm gonna write W equals 70. Straight from the start, W equals 70. Now we're also told that this was 10 more than twice the number of envelopes that Amy did. Now part A says write an equation showing the relationship between the number of envelopes that William and Amy both did. So William's number, 70, but let's just put W for now, is 10 more than twice the number of Amy's. 10 more than twice the number of Amy's. So I'm gonna get my 10 more then. I'm gonna put plus 10. So I'm setting it up. 10 more than twice the number of Amy's. So twice the number of Amy's, I can write as 2A. So this is pretty much what they're wanting for part A. So we don't even really need to put the 70 in there yet. Maybe for B, we're gonna to have to do that, but part A asks for an equation showing the relationship between the number of envelopes that William and Amy both stuff. So we've got a W over here, we've got an A there. This shows that relationship. Now, for part B, it says, how many did Amy do? So if we know that W equals 2A plus 10, and we also know that W equals 70, we are going to substitute this in right here. So I'm gonna change color. If w is 70, this equals two times A plus 10. Now it's a two-step equation. So we just gotta do the same to both sides, subtract 10. Subtract 10, we're getting closer to finding the A. 60 equals 2A. Now to get A on its own, we divide both sides by the coefficient of A, and divide by two, divide by two. So in this case, we've got 30 equals A, because the two's cancel. So how many envelopes did she stuff? The answer is 30 envelopes. That's our answer. Okay, so that was number 65. Okay, so question number 66. So you gotta be very careful when we're adding. I just made a mistake a second ago, so let's take a look. We're told that there's two groups of people, group A and group B. Now there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven people, seven people in each group. Now we'll ask for the mean of each group. So first of all, I'm gonna find the sum of everything in group A. When you add all of these up, you should get 1792. When you add all of the numbers up for group B, you should get 1820. So when we're asked for the mean of each group, we've gotta find the mean of group A first, which is 1792, divided by the number of people, which is seven, so when I do 1792 divided by seven, I get 256. So this is looking like a better answer to my other. Now, the units are dollars, so we should also include that. The mean of group B 
is going to be 18 20 divided by 7. So 18 20 divided by 7 is going to give me an answer of $260. 260. So if you end up getting a decimal that goes on and it doesn't tell you to round, which is what just happened to me when I added this up incorrectly over here, that's a, that's a really big sign to go back and check. Next, we're after the median for each group. So one way to do the median is to line these up in order. So, okay, let me line them up in order. The smallest one is 214 followed by 218 and then 224, then 245, 284, 295, and then finally 312. Okay, so as we go through this, we're going to cancel one for one. So over here, over here, over here. Okay, because there's an odd number, there's seven people, we're left with one in the middle. So our median, and we must label which median it is. Our median for A is $245. Okay, our median for B, let's try and go through these. Our median for B, so we've got to line them up. So 215, 223, 230, 2. Four, six, two, nine, five, three, oh, one, and three, ten. Okay, so again, I'm going to cancel these out. Okay, so our median for B equals two hundred and forty six dollars. Okay, so which measure best describes the center of the data for each group and why? So, a lot of students will get confused by this. When you see measure, usually we're thinking of using a ruler or a protractor, measure this or measure that. Well, measure is not only a, a verb, but it's also a noun. So, the noun measure means mean, median, mode. Which measure, which one of these is best? Now, we, all, we calculated the mean up here and we just calculated the median. So I'm assuming that it's talking about which one of these two measures is the best. Okay, so as I was just saying to my students, I was a little caught up on this question thinking which was the best average, but it does say which measure best describes the center. And as the median is the middle number, the median best describes the center in this case. Best describes the center because it's the middle number. So you could go on to write that because it's the middle number. Okay, that was question 66. Okay, so 67. The city is planning to add a jogging track to a neighborhood park. The figure below is a scale drawing of the jogging track and its scale is half an inch is to 15 feet. Okay, so it says, what is the actual, what is the area inside the actual jogging track? So the jogging track includes this rectangle in the middle and a semicircle on the left and a semicircle on the right. So that's the entire jogging track. Now, if we're after the area inside, we need to understand that area is made up by the rectangle together with the semicircle here and the semicircle here. This makes up the entire shape. So the area of the rectangle is A equals LW. And because when you add these two areas together, you're really getting the area of an entire circle we also need to remember our area formula for a circle. And this is an entire circle right here. A equals pi r squared. So first things first, this isn't the actual size. The actual size is, is much bigger than one inch by two and a half inches. After all, it's a park. Um, but we're going to use a scale. So if half an inch is 15 feet, then this dimension here 
which says one inch, one inch. Because it's double the half inch, it's therefore going to be double the actual 15 feet as well. So half an inch is to 15, so one inch is to 30 feet. So I'm just going to write in there 30 feet. Now, because we're dealing with the real numbers, I'm going to get rid of rid of the one here as well. Now, two and a half inches, so that's our other one, 2.5 inches. Because this is five times the half inch, it's five half inches and two and a half, therefore, we are also going to multiply the 15 by five, and that will give us our feet, that is 2.5 inches. So 15 times five would give you 75 feet. So we know instead of this 2.5, it's now going to be 75 feet. So basically we have our length and our width of the rectangle, the 30 feet and the 75 feet, so we could just multiply those together. But then we also have to deal with this circle as well. Now, for our circular circle formula area, we need the radius. So we're really looking for, in green on the screen right now, I'm drawing the radius. Now, there is something that helps us here. Because our radius is basically half of this width, the original one inches that we're told right in the middle is the diameter. So this radius is half an inch on our picture. So the radius, as we're dealing with half an inch, this is precisely our scale. So half an inch is 15 feet. So we know that our radius is actually 15 feet. So now we pretty much have everything we need. I'm gonna turn over to the red and then I'm gonna do some calculations now. I don't have a lot of space on the on the screen, so I'm going to do it over here. Let's deal with the rectangle first. We know that this is 30 feet, and we know that this is 75 feet. And so in this case, we're going to do 30 times 75. So I'm just going to set that up, 75 and 30. We're going to multiply. So 5 30s are 150. And then 730s are 210 with a 0, 210. So it's going to be this, and then over 0, 5, 2, and 2. And so this is our area of the rectangle, and the unit should be feet squared. So this has given us our area inside this rectangle all the way up to the other side of the rectangle. We're dealing with this to here, up here, and then back across. But we still have to deal with the circle part as well. So I'm gonna change over. Let's choose um, a green here. So in looking at the area of the circle, and remember these two semi-circles make up one full circle. So our radius we said was, what did we say it was 15 feet. So A equals pi R squared. Now pi we're told to use 22 over 7. So this equals 22 over 7 times by R squared. And R is 15. And 15 squared we can do right there. So in this case, this equals, well, 15 times 15 is going to be 225. 225. And then we still have to multiply it by 22 over 7. So our answer is going to be 22 over 7 times by 225. So I'm just going to grab a calculator really quickly and do this in one shot. So I'm dealing with 22 divided by 7, and then I'm going to multiply that by our 225. And that gives an answer of 707. Now I'm rounding that to the nearest uh, nearest whole number. It should be 707.1428572, but now I'm trying to look. Usually it tells us to round in the question, um, but it's not doing that here. It's just saying use pi as 22 over 7. So I'm just going to write it 707, and then our units would be feet 
squared. This is an area. Okay, now I'm also remembering one other thing is that we haven't fully answered this question yet. We've just worked out that the area of the rectangle was 2 to 50 feet squared. We worked out the area of the circle was 707 feet squared. But in this question, it was after what is the actual, what is the area inside the actual jogging track? So that's everything here. We've got to add these two together. So we have a seven, bring down the five, that becomes nine, and that's two. So our total area is 2957 feet squared. And this is a very important part. After doing all of this work, I almost forgot to add them both together. So it's very important that you do this. Okay, so this is part B of that same question. Now, we're going to need some of the things from the previous question as well, but I'm just going to sketch out the diagram of this jogging field now. We still have the rectangle in the middle, and then we have the two semicircles. Now, this time the question is telling us, well, one thing is, instead of 22 over 7, which is what we used last time for pi, this time we're told to use 3.14, so that's one thing we must listen to and we must do. The next thing is, we're not after area, we're after the length of the jogging track. So we've got to think, what does that really mean? Where are people jogging around this thing? And so if anyone's ever watched running track and field or even the Olympics, this is the shape of the track that people run. And you'll see the blue marker right now going around the shape and drawing, outlining the path that the runners will have to make. And so I've just done one full lap and you'll notice that we went across the bottom of the rectangle which was 75 feet from the last page. We're told this was 75 feet. And then we went around the length of this part of the circumference. This is one half of the circumference. And then we went across the top of the rectangle which is another 75 feet and then we went around the other half of the circumference. So it seems to me like we need to find out this distance here and also this distance here and then add those to the 75 and then plus another 75. So these two themselves, these two distances make up a full circle. So instead of thinking of it as half a circumference plus half a circumference, really all we need to do is find the circumference of this thing. And as we found out from our last last answers, we um, know that the radius of this of this circle is 15 feet. And so with the circumference of a circle being 2 times pi times r, really what we're looking to do is 2 times 3.14 times the radius which is 15. Now some of this I can do pretty quickly in my head. The 2 times the 15 gives us 30. So really what we're trying to do is 30 times 3.14. Now I'm getting a little lazy, so I'm going to jump on my calculator. But when I do 30 times by 3.14, I get an answer of 94.20. It's 94.2. do need to put a unit, and the units are feet. Okay, now this answer of 94.2 feet, we must remember, is only for going around the circle. Is only go for going around the left and the right of this track. But we can't forget to take the distances here and here, which is 94.2, and then we've got to add it to this 75 and also the top, the 75, and that gives us the distance all the way around. So we've got to add that to 75 and then add another 75. Now. I know that 75 plus 75 is really 150, and so our math really is 150 plus 94.2. Now, the 0.2 stays, the 4 stays, 5 plus 9 is 14, carry the 1, so I get an answer of 244.2. Now, my units are not feet squared because that's for an area. Our units are just feet. We do need the units. So when we find our final answer we should box it up and also if we have a space for it we should go up there and write it in 244.2 
FT, we must remember the units. And that's our answer for part B. Okay. So right now, this is number 68. And 68 is a tricky question because it's talking about simulations. Now, often with simulations, it's a way for us to look at things that happen in the real world in a, in a simulated manner, which means we can represent it using numbers or using some other system that allows us to, to play with this data. Now, probably the best way for me to explain this simulation is just to start doing it. So we're told that the probability of this freshman at a certain college taking art is around 28%. Okay, so we know this is also, this can be written as 28 over 100. It can also be simplified. It could be written as 0 0.28. We know that these probabilities all are all mean the same. The conductor simulations to find out the number of freshmen out of a randomly selected group of 25 who are in art class. Okay, so it wants to know the number. It doesn't want to know a percent, it wants the number of freshmen out of 25 that are chosen who are in art class. Start with the first cell at the top of first cell at the top row of a table of random numbers. So these are all completely random numbers. They're random four digit numbers. Zero could have turned up in the first spot as much as one, as much as nine, as much as eight. So these are all completely random. Now, if this is the first time we're doing simulations, this will look very, very strange and odd, and it's not very natural. But in this case, this is how we will do it. Because we are told that 28%, 28% are in art. Now, we're using this simulation, but we need to represent, we need to have a rule for this 28%. Now, given that these people are taken at random, if they are one of the 28%, then we've got to say that they are in art. If they are one of the 72%, we've got to say they are not in art. So, in order to represent this, even though we've got four digit numbers in each of these cells, one thing that we can do is look at the first two numbers. Now, we're looking at the first two numbers because we know that 28% is in art. So we can claim that if this number is between 00, 0 to 27. Now, I'm choosing 27 because that gives us 28 numbers. The 00, 0 counts as one number. And let's face it, the maximum number we can get from two digits is 99. It's not 100. So from 0, 0 all the way up to 99, that gives us 100 options. And so we can claim, we can make this assumption that if the number is between 0, 0 to 27, then that should pretty much give us 28% of all possible numbers because this gives us 28 options out of 100. So if the two numbers in a row are between 0, 0 and 27, we're going to say that that is somebody who is in art class. So let's look at the first two. The first two are 43. And so I'm just setting up a table here. No art. Art and no art. Now the first two numbers are 43. So we can say, well, that's part of the 72%. That's not 27 and below. So they're in no art. The next two numbers are 19, and so they are in art because that's part of those numbers. The next two are 71, and so because that, those numbers are, are 28 and higher, that's assumed to be no art based on our assumption. Then we've got 29, again, no art. Then we've got 41, no art. Then we've got 44, no art. 51. And then we've got 13, so 13 counts as an art because it's 27 or less. Then we've got 39, 52. Now, so far we've done 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 10. We've done 10 people so far. So remember, we're counting all the way up to 25 people. A randomly selected group of 25 people we're representing in this way. 
So next we've got 54. You know what? Then we've got 15. So that would be an art person. Then we've got 49. You know what? Then we've got 17. So that would count as an art person. Then we've got 97. 42. So those are both no arts. Then we've got 91. And 44. And 98. And then 35. So far a lot of no arts, which is what we would expect if only 28% of them are actually taking art. So, so far that is 20 people. 20 people. So we need to take 25 people. So I've got another 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. We need to stop before this 54. We've got to go all the way up to 53. So 92. That would be a no art. Then we've got a 60. No art. Then we've got a 16. That would count as an art person. 69. No art. And then a 53. So that would be no art. So let's just review the question again. It says conduct a simulation to find the number of freshmen out of a randomly selected group of 25 who are in art class. So we were told 28% are in art. We made an assumption that we're looking at two digit numbers, and if it's between 0, 0, and 27, that represents the 28%. That represents people who are taking art. And so we would tally that as an art person. We did this for 25 of these random numbers, so we're not being confused by the fact that they're four digit numbers. We don't care they're four digit, we're just going two by two all the way through them. And we were told to start with the first cell, which is right here, in the top row, and then move right. And then once we reach the end, we need to then start with the, uh, once you reach the end of the row, start with the next row. So that's what we did. Okay, so we were asked to find the number of freshmen who are in art. So in, in this case, it would be five freshmen in art. In art. And so this is our answer to number 68, part A. Okay, so part B now mixes things up a little. It says, conduct a second simulation beginning with the first cell in the fourth row. So if it is first, second, third, fourth, this is the first cell in the fourth row. And then it goes on to say, then conduct a third simulation starting, beginning, with the first cell in the seventh row. So if this is four, five, six, seven, with the first cell in the seventh row. In each of these simulations, how many freshmen out of a randomly selected group of 25 are in art class? So let's start off with the second simulation. Okay, so I'm going to keep my colors blue. So this is art, and this is not in art, no art. Okay, and keep in mind this is the second, and then if we're staying organized, our third simulation, remember we already did the, the first simulation in the last question, art and no art. Okay, so I'm going to keep these colors the same, because this is a very tricky question right now. So we're still keeping our assumption of if 28% are art, we're going to count this as our 0 0-0 numbers all the way to 2, 7, because this is 28 out of the 100 possible things. So that's what we're going to stick for both the red and the blue things that we're about to do right now. Okay, so... We're going to go for 25 people. So the first one is 57. Next one is 87. Next one is 99. 46. So all of these numbers are more than 27. Next one is 18. So we've got our first art, followed by 39. 15. That's less than 27. 56. 16, less than 27, 52, 
67. So we just got to be careful that we don't do more than 25 people. And each two digit number is simulated as a person. Then we've got 0, 1. So that counts as an art. 14, so that's another art. Got 92. And 90. 60. 26. So 26 sneaks in just under 27. So that's an art. 40. 53. And 53 again. Now keep in mind we've got 5, 10, 15, 20 people that we've just done, so we need 5 more people. So 54, 27, now 27, 0, 0 to 27 is art, so that's going to go there. Then we've got 87, then 70, so so far this is 24 people, and so we're going to stop at this one. So 43 is going to be right there. So in this case, with the second simulation, so let's remember the question. In each of these simulations, how many freshmen out of a randomly selected group of 25 are in art class? So in this one, there are five, six, seven. Seven students in art out of 25 random selected selected students okay so now we're going to do the same again but this time we're starting with the first cell of the seventh row so I'm doing this in red it's so got 46 which is more than 27 87 same again 12 46 57, 87, 82, 37, 66, 68, 46, 11, 42, 33, 74, Zero, 08, so finally got another art, 84, 93, 19, 19 is between 00, zero 27, 97. Now, keep in mind that these two rows were 20 people. If we add up all of these tallies, that's 20 people, and we need 25 because the randomly selected group of people has to comprise of 25 people. Got 62 and 07, so that's our other art. Then 40, then 47, then 97. Okay, and that, if we add them up 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, that gives us 25 people. And so in this case, 5 students out of 25 randomly selected students are in art. So that's our answer to part B. Okay, so part C takes us to um, another place as well, another level. It says based on these three simulations what is the probability that 7 out of a randomly selected group of 25 will be in art class? So this is asking for the probability that, and really even though it doesn't say it specifically, it's meaning the probability of exactly 7 students out of a group, probability that choosing, tw choosing a group of 25 students that exactly 7 of them will take art. So we just did three simulations. We did simulation one, two, and three. Now in simulation one, 
if you turn back to your notes, we had five students taking art. Simulation two, we had seven students taking art. And remember, these are out of a out of a set of 25 randomly selected students, which just happened to be two digit numbers, but that's how we represented it in this simulation. And in the third simulation, we had five students, five freshmen. And so when we look back to our question here, which is asking us the probability that exactly seven out of 25 will take R, well, in our simulation, seven out of 25 happened one time out of a total of three simulations. And so this would be our probability, one over three, because out of all three simulations, this is a total simulation, simulations, out of three simulations, one simulation had one simulation had seven students taking art out of the 25. And so one out of three would be our probability in this case. 69. For me, 69 seems a little easier because this is talking about simple interest. Now, simple interest, we've got to ask ourselves, are we pretty? And this is a fun way to remember a very boring formula. I is pretty. I equals PRT. So are you pretty? I is pretty. Now, I in this case is our interest. P is the principle. So let me write this down to remind us. I is interest. P is the principle. And the principle is the initial am amount of money that we invest or that we borrow. R is your rate, your either borrowing interest rate or savings interest rate. And T is the term. And really one way to think about T is time. And usually it's in years. And so in this case, years would be the term if it is in years okay so let's go back to this question right now because William invested eight hundred dollars well that's your principal in an account that paid five percent simple interest per year so that's your rate and keep in mind that this rate is zero point zero five how much interest will William earn over three years? Well, we've just been told the term right there. The term is three years. So I'm gonna put my T there. Now we're trying to find I. So let's do our work right here. I equals, always show this formula. I equals PRT. Now we're after I, so that equals your principal, which is 800, times by your rate, which is 0 0.05, times by the term, which is three years. And so as we solve this, we could multiply these in any order, but in this case, I'm just gonna go from left to right. And so I'm gonna do 800 times by 0 0.05 times by three. And that gives me an answer of 120. Now it's important to remember that this 120 is your interest only. So it's dollars and it's not the amount in the bank. This is only the amount of interest earned. So if you kept that money in the account, it would have $120 on top of the principal, which was $800. So in this case, $120 is your answer for the interest over three years. Next, part B says, William withdrew all of his money from the account after three years. If the bank charged him a 2% fee on withdrawing his money, how much will William did William withdraw? Okay, so all of his money was his original 800 plus the 120 interest. So all of his money was $920. 
Now if they're charging him a 2% fee, we need to think about how much that 2% is. So we could take our 920 and we could multiply this by 0 0.02. That's 2% right here. 0 0.02 is 2%. If we do this, this is going to get us our answer of the fee. So I'm about to do that right now. 920 times by 0 0.02. And that gives me an answer of 18.4. So 18.4. And really this is money, so I'm going to put the zero on the end, and this is dollars. So if they've charged him that fee to withdraw this much money, we could say, you know, this is also a, a very oddly worded question, because if he's withdrawing 920, how could they have already taken this fee from him? But I believe what they're after is... 920 minus the amount he's got to pay which is 1840 and so in this case I'm going to put my dot on a couple of zeros and now it's after us to take this amount off well 1840 is almost twenty dollars so he's got nine hundred and one dollars and sixty cents that's how much he would have withdrawn after they took this fee and so this right here is the 2% fee. Now, if we understand all of that stuff and we get it great, I'm about to show you a slightly different method. So he still had his $800 in there and he earned 120 So it's correct that he had $920 ready to withdraw. Now, if they charged him this 2% fee, that means that he couldn't withdraw 100% of this. It means that he could only withdraw 98%, the other side of the 2%. He could only withdraw 98% of this. So over here, where we had to find the fee, the 2%, and then we deducted it right here, if we recognize that he is only able to withdraw 98%, we could do the $920, and we could multiply by 0 0.98. That's allowing us to find 98% of the 920. And so when you multiply these out, you still get the same answer. And keep in mind, there is a multiply that's in there with the parentheses. We don't need to write it because the 920 is right up against the parentheses. But when we do multiply them, we get 901.6, which is money. So we're going to put the extra zero. And this is your answer for the amount that he withdrew. So that was number 69.